Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Adoption Happy Hour brought to you by NAP. We are the National Association of Adoptees and Parents, where it is our mission to unify the adoption community and elevate our diverse voices by promoting dialogue, understanding, and healing through education, awareness, and connections. I'm Marcy Keithley, along with Jennifer Falsing, Beth Story, and I believe fellow board member Barbara Robertson just hopped on as well. Um, we're excited to have all, all of you this evening. If you're joining us for the very first time, make sure you do let us know in the chat bar. And at this time, let Alicia know um, how you identify in the adoption constellation and where you're from. So before we get started, we are going to have a couple of announcements. We do want to remind everyone this is a public meeting with no guarantee that information or identity is confidential. Portions of this event are recorded and may be shared in our private happy hour group on Facebook and as well as our YouTube channel. Please remain on mute. If you haven't done so already, please make sure that you are on mute. Uh, you're welcome to raise your hand on screen or the virtual hand to be recognized. And please feel free to post your comments in the chat. If you are experiencing a serious mental health event or suicidal thought, please contact a licensed professional or the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline by dialing 988. Jen, you want to go with the programs? Yep, I was trying to get my mouse back. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Can you guys see that? Okay. So here's our upcoming, this is our list of programs and what we have upcoming. Uh, on the 22nd of this month, we have Danielle Gaudet's Self-Love Essentials for the Adoption Constellation. On March 1st, our next happy hour, uh, we have uh, Jacoba Ballard. Uh, she is the subject of the show um, our father and then on the 12th we have putting yourself together with uh after reunion with dr joyce and that is at 6 p.m eastern time on 3 14 is when we have first families which is uh amy seek and amber jimerson who facilitate that but they are having a very special guest next time. So I'm going to stop sharing and let Beth show you who her special guest is. Um, <clears throat> sometimes they do have a special guest on. Oh, dear. I think I switched, didn't I? Sorry about that. Oh, no. What are you seeing right now? Are you seeing Alicia? Yes. Okay. I don't know what happened. Okay. I'm sorry. Just a second. They are having a special guest on, and she has a book that is just coming out, and I'll have it back up here in a second. I think Alicia just wanted to get in quick here right <laughs> not her fault that wasn't yeah. her at all that was me okay here we go um we heard we heard Gretchen speak at the cub retreat and we knew that this was going to be something really special so she, her book is the politics of adoption and the privilege of American motherhood and um, she is going to be joining Amber and Amy on March 14th for a very special program. And you can register for this just like you do any, um, any of our other ones. And we can put some of those links in the chat throughout the program tonight. But I think this will be a really, really good one that you won't want to miss. And her book is available on Amazon. Uh, it's pre-order right now. The release date is February 28th. So uh, that'll be coming in the mail to me shortly. <clears throat> and then um, I know we, we've talked about um, the places we've been going and the things that, that we are we are doing. Um, yeah, I'm sure you've heard that we are going to Roots Tech. We are going to be there as exhibitors. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
Beth and Cara are actually doing a presentation with one of the DNA angels. Um, so it's going to be a really great time. But hey, you know, we're going to be in Salt Lake City. So we got an invitation and uh, to for NAP to be a sponsor of Reckoning with the Primal Wound. They're having a screening while we're in Salt Lake City on Friday, March 1st. So we're going to uh, sneak out of the exhibit hall when we can and take an Uber and uh, Beth and I are giving a presentation at the uh, screening and panel discussion for um, Reckoning with the Primal Wound. If it comes to your area and you get a chance to see it, please do. Um, Paul, Jack, Franzak is going to be there and share some of um, his show, True Identity, and tell you a bit about his story. And then Ashley Mitchell, um, who goes under Big Tough Girl. It should be a, a great event. Okay, and then you know, every time we get together, we talk about the summit. So, um, there we go. Okay, April 25th through the 28th, we are rounding up the three communities again, the adoptee, the assisted reproduction, and the NPE communities for another fabulous conference. And this time we'll be at the Denver Hyatt Regency. There is so much packed into this event. Um, 50 plus speakers, creative workshops, panels, keynotes, small group support sessions. We are gonna feed you like crazy. Um, almost every meal during the, this three plus days event is part of your registration fee. So it's going to be, and we're gonna have some of the best entertainment, most unique and specific to our communities entertainment you will find anywhere. Um, we are incorporating all three communities into just about every session that there is. A few of them are specific, but just like this, one of our keynote panels will have someone representing each community. Um, again, Denver, Aurora, Hyatt Regency, we have a great rate for reserving a room. And so you will want to get that. You want to make your reservation before the block is full. Um, T-shirts. You can order your T-shirt ahead of time and have it delivered, and then you can wear it there. We actually won't be selling them there because it's much easier to do it this way. And we've got a couple of new designs this year, as well as um, DNA Don't Lie was our, was our hit T-shirt last year, and it will be back. But we have a couple of new ones. And so... Um, all of these links will be in the chat here in just a few minutes. So please plan to get a ticket. A few tickets are left at the early bird price, but just a few, and then the price will go up. So you're going to want to register soon. That's it for me. Absolutely. And I just want to, I don't know if you guys can see this, if I hold this up. This is one of the t-shirts, so you just go on, we'll put the link in, you just order it, and it comes to your door in a couple of days. Um, but this is a really cool, if you guys know Sandy Smith, she was at our mini meetup up at Pokagon this fall, and we were having a great time with Lorraine Dusky and everything, and she, she just kind of blurted out this statement, and we're like, oh, we like that. So we incorporated her statement and made a shirt, and it is, uh, I have frickin' twisted roots. So she got a good kick out of it. So, hey, you know, keep your t-shirt ideas coming. <laughs> okay, ladies, is that it? Yes. We ready to go? Okay. Well, thank you both. Okay, so it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Alicia Williams at this time. She is a seasoned professional with a diverse background, uh, unveiling a remarkable journey by resilience and self-discovery. Beyond her roles as a compassionate educator spanning over two decades, working with at-risk students, and most recently serving as quality assurance manager for developmentally mental disabled residents living in residential facilities. She shares a poignant personal narrative that unravels the complexities of her own adoption. So this time we would like to welcome Alicia to Adoption Happy Hour. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Hi. Thank you all for being here and thank you for having me. I'm, I'm very excited. You're welcome. To be here. Yes, many of your faces I did get to see at last year's summit. So happy to be here again. Um, 
just want to just want to say god bless each and every one of you for what you do because without groups like this many of us would not have made it through some of the journeys that we're traveling through um my own personal journey and my own personal connection to adoption came um, purely by accident. Um, and, and I'll start with forming my triad and, and how I'm connected to this. Um, proudly, I am 58 years old. Um, I have been with my husband for 40 years. We have two birth children, two amazing children, one boy and one girl. Um, prided myself in being a helicopter mom, <laughs> loved being a helicopter mom, did not realize that many of my helicopter mom tendencies was rooted and came from some of the experiences that I had in childhood. Um, some of the, um, experiences that actually went the opposite of how I was raised. Um, I had a very vivid memory of childhood from very early on. I remembered too clearly. I remembered my second birthday clearly. And my second birthday was always a magical day for me. Um, I remember the little white fur coat I got. I remember the little riding bouncing pony that I got. I remember the little Vespa scooter that I got. It was such an incredible day that I never really comprehended why a two-year-old had such a vivid memory of that day. Um, many occasions in my life were huge celebrations. And I thought that was normal. I thought that's what all kids did. I thought every birthday was like Toys R Us opening up and pouring into your living room. Um, Little did I know, you know, as you're four, five, six, and you don't really have um, uh, social outlets where you're going to other kids' homes at that age, little did I know as I got into being a little bit older, like seven, eight, nine, ten, where you start to actually go to other friends' homes, that this was not, this was not normal. This was a little bit over and above and uh a little bit extravagant from what most kids were experiencing. So I never really understood that. Why, why life was so big, why life was so um, you know, fairy tale journey-like. I had a fairy tale father. You know, I had one of those dads that um bought you the little fur coat and bought you the dozen of roses and told you if no man ever buys you a dozen roses you've already had your dozen roses if no man ever buys you a fur coat you've had your fur coat so I grew up thinking that this was a, a very normal way of life and obviously I'm a woman of color um, but I grew up in Ann Arbor um in a gated community never went to public school. So I was aware that culturally, our family was very different from my cousins and from what I would experience when we went to other um, people of color in their homes and things like that. But it was still very normal to me. So very, in, very indulgent, very um, lavish lifestyle that I had. But then there was another side of it. There was a side that was very um, complex and that seemed to be forced and staged. And that I never understood. Um, that when we were with friends and family, it almost seemed like my brother and I were always on stage and we're always performing. Our parents were always, show them what you learned in ballet. Show them what you got you know, what? show them what you got for your birthday. Show them this and show them that. We were always dressed to the nines. We were always patent leather shoes and dresses. And it became a show that when anyone came to the house, we knew we had to go and straighten our clothes and put on our best. And we were going to be asked to do something, whether it was a recital, whether it was a poem, whether it was something from ballet class. And so that became to be very, um, it was a time of anxiety for me because 
it needed to be perfect. We always had to show perfection. And as I got a little bit older, that anxiety for perfection started to take over in my personality. And I started to have anxiety issues and separation anxiety issues and performance anxiety issues um, and performance in school. You know, grades had to be at a certain standing. Um, reports had to be a certain way and, and striving to be the top of the class and striving to be the A-listers and things like that. And that really started to take a toll. Um, and I would say on myself and my brother, but I only can speak from my own experiences, where at a very young age, I started exhibiting um, signs that I needed some therapy. And luckily, for those of you that know anything about Ann Arbor, Ann Arbor is the mecca for therapy. And, and being a child in the 60s and the 70s, every little kid went to therapy at Tuesday and Wednesday after school. They were lined up and we all got out early. So therapy was readily available to me. But the things that I was experiencing and the things that I was sharing, which I thought were normal, I very quickly learned from the therapists that were treating me when I got a lot of mm -hmm's and ah's and a lot of sidebar questions and conversations with my parents that I wasn't privy to. So I started feeling like I, I, I don't know where, where I'm getting my help. I didn't feel like help was coming to me. I felt like the help was being given to my parents. And that was very obvious because I was the one in the session. I was the one saying, I'm scared to be by myself. I'm scared to go to sleep at night. I'm scared mommy doesn't love me. I'm scared daddy's going to leave me. And never understanding where those feelings were coming from and never having those questions answered but hearing the sidebar conversations with my parents, it's going to be that way. Psst, 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 psst. She's like that. Psst, 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 psst. That's been in her all along. And there was all these little triggers and phrases that slowly began to tear away at my personality that I was different for some reason. I'm different, I don't know why. For some reason, there's a secret that I don't understand. And that grew and it grew within, inside of me to almost a feeling that I could not trust my parents, a feeling that I'm alone in this because everybody knows something about me that no one is sharing. Am I still, I lost my picture. So I hope I'm still, I'm still not if you still see me. <laughs> is anybody still there? I went, I dropped down to two people. Oh yeah, we can see you okay. might have just hit your view okay. button up in the corner. Okay. Um. So, I, as I got a little bit older and got into adolescence, the, the, the catechism between my parents grew. It was as if I was a piece of property. I would be on display and then I'd be put away. And when I wasn't on display, I was made to feel like I was broken that I wasn't measuring up, that I wasn't meeting expectations. And so the catchphrases that had now become part of my daily routine, um, we expected you, we know that you're different. Um, another thing that was always said was, we know more about you than you'll ever know about yourself. We understand you more than you will ever know about yourself. And that was one that just welled up something inside of me because I felt like they didn't know me at all. And I'm screaming for someone to know me. I'm screaming for someone to understand me. And those screams carried on. Not only was I verbally saying 
I need help. I verbally saying I need answers. It was coming out in my sleep pattern where I was crying out in my sleep. I was having night terrors. And these terrors and these dreams were relatively close to being the same at all the time. I was either lost and separated from my parents or I was taken by force from my parents or I was left somewhere and my parents would just walk away. And I slowly started realizing that I'm not connected to them. And I figured that out by 13. By 13, I felt like the rest of the way, I've got to do it myself because they don't get me. They don't hear me and they don't understand me. So at 13, I had already decided I'm going to be a different kind of parent. I had already decided I was going to be a different kind of mom. I was going to listen to my kids no matter what. I was going to believe my children no matter what. I was going to be there in every single way. They would not be forced to perform. They would not be forced to be in any type of activities that they didn't want to be in. I was going to be the opposite of what mom and dad had been. Granted, mom and dad were amazing people. But the nurturing that I needed inside of me, we weren't there. We had not bonded in that way. My parents ran adult foster care homes. They took care of um, developmentally disabled men. So I grew up in a home, a very huge old country farmhouse, where we had one side of the home and they had the other side. So we had documents and files from um, what we call the clients. And I was in charge of, of quite a bit of things at a very early age, 16, 17. I, I was acting as a co-manager at this home. And we had filing cabinets that kept track of all of our consumers' information, their demographics, their history, and all of those things, where they came from, how they came to be in foster care. And one day, a file, if you've ever opened a filing cabinet and you know how it doesn't sit quite right and you can't close that filing cabinet all the way back in, so you have to open it all the way out and take the rack out, there was a file that was not fitting quite right in that rack. So I had to take the filing cabinet out. And when I took that filing cabinet out, there was a folder in the file that was in there and I opened it up and... It was a person's name in there that was not any of our consumers. It was a female's name. The name was Sharon. I had no idea who this was. It had no connection to me, not in my wildest dreams that I have anything to do with this. I just figured it was maybe, you know, a consumer that my parents were thinking about getting and that we never did. But I needed to put this file back in the proper place. And so I brought this folder um, which was in the same type of folder as the rest of our consumers. I brought this folder to my mother and I said, whose is this? Where does this go? And my mother grabbed it and she slapped me. I'm talking teeth chattering slap. And I was totally taken back because I had no idea what, what just happened. What did I just do? What will I never do again? because I don't know what I just did, but I'm never going to do it again. And that was the first moment that told me that was me. Somehow I was connected to that folder. Somehow that file held answers that I wasn't supposed to know. And I actually asked, I think within two weeks, I had asked, was that me? Am I adopted? Is there something I need to know about me? Was that my name? And with how a hesitation, absolutely not. That is not you. You are crazy. It has nothing to do with you. You shouldn't be snooping in things that, that don't belong to you. That is not you. It has nothing to do with you. I don't know what you think you saw. You didn't see what you really saw. And I, I actually, I was raised 
Catholic. They went to parochial schools and that, that Catholic girl, obedient girl kicked in. And not one day after that, did I question that again? Mom and dad said, that's not me. So it's not. Plain and simple. It's not. I don't know what I saw. I don't know what it was. I don't know why they don't get me. I don't know why I'm not connected. I don't know why I have these memories. I don't know why I'm made to perform and then once put back on the shelf. I don't understand any of these things, but mom and dad said that they're mom and dad, and that's the end of it. And that's where that stayed. And that box got closed and that lid got put on and that got put on the shelf. So I went on with life. I went on to college. I met an amazing man. We had two children, six years apart. And I had mentioned to my husband that I always felt like I needed to adopt, that we needed to provide a home or a family to a child that was in need. I had always felt that way. When I played dolls as little girls, I would have a black baby doll and a white baby doll, and I always adopted the baby doll. She was my daughter. Didn't matter that one was white, didn't matter that one was black. There was something in me that understood the concept of adoption at a very early age. So we actually, it wasn't something that we set out to do. It was just something that God placed in our lives that this little girl came to be um, through a friend of ours who was doing foster care. And we met this little girl and we fell in love with her and her children fell in love with her. And we jokingly said, if she ever becomes available, let us know first. And we were surprisingly met with her mother's rights are about to be terminated. And we immediately said, we want her, we want her. Not only did I have two amazing kids that I had in everything and they were, they were uh, kind of doing the same thing that I said I would never do. They were overindulged. They had way too much stuff. They had way too many privileges. They had way too much freedom. Um, you know, we said, we have enough love we have enough space, we have enough time, we have enough resources that we can give to another child. And so we adopted our daughter, Jacqueline. And that adoption was amazingly integrated very seamlessly because of the mother that I had, I knew that I would never make my daughter feel any different than my birth daughter. So everything, I may, I, I consciously went to classes, went to parenting, went to, to therapists to make sure that I was trying to keep them balanced. Little did I know that I was also taking away and robbing my adopted daughter of her own identity because I was lending her in with my birth daughter, that I was not allowing her her own individual personalities, her own individual traits. They became two versions of me. Boy, that was that backfiring. Boy, did that backfire. My mini me daughter, who I gave birth to, was exactly like me. My other mini me daughter, who I thought I was creating in my mirror image, was nothing like me. And I was trying to put her in a box that my other daughter was in and that I was in, and that would that I thought the model mom needed to be for her. And instead of acknowledging and recognizing that she's cut from a different cloth, that she's from a different stock that she has her own embedded fibers of connection, of memories that I was trying to erase out of her. Subsequently, through her adoption, she had a sibling that became available for adoption as well. 
So we had a boy and two girls. And then now here was another young man who was 10 years older than her. And we had the foolish concept that we could just merge him right into our family. A successful adoption is what I had called her. A failed adoption is what I had called him. And I regret using those words. I regret using those words terribly. But those words were given to us from the agencies that placed them as well. Those words were embedded into our fiber when he was delivered to us not with the love and care that the little toddler girl was, but the 10 year old boy was delivered with the big two inch red binder. He had the red binder and the garbage bag where all of his worldly possessions were in. And he was brought to our home and delivered at our steps. And the caseworker said, good luck keeping him here. He's a runner. His whole goal is to get back to his mom. And that was his first introduction to us. That was a pivotal moment in my parenting and in understanding that I actually had four different people, four different people that I needed to raise very differently, very independently, and irregardless of how I was raised. I could not do what I had, had been done to me. I could not do what I had done to my birth daughter. I could not do what I had done to my adopted daughter, to this young man. He was vastly different. So as I'm now trying to navigate through being an adopted parent and a birth parent, never in my wildest dreams would a Christmas gift from my daughter give me the surprise of my life. See, my parents had instilled this deep sense of history. My father's family celebrated um, uh, family reunions for over 125 years, almost all of them consecutively. There were very few years that were missed. And the, the recent ones were due to COVID. My mother's family also knew an extensive amount about, about their background. Their maiden names were Washingtons. We knew that my mother's family were actually from the slave family of George Washington's brother and the lineage and the travels that they had went and whose homes they had passed through. All of that was documented. So we had a very strong, rich history. So when I was given an Ancestry DNA kit for Christmas in 2018, it was never to discover anything about me. It was to solidify and enrich the story that I had been told my entire life about my history, about my family. And so I would, did not rush to turn that in. It was, Chris, it was given to me for Christmas it was February when I realized I needed to get this turned in. I didn't want to waste this gift that my daughter had given me. And I turned it in and I sent in my sample. And in April, April 19th, I got the email that popped up and said that your sample is ready. And I was so excited. And I already had an Ancestry account. The, the Bennett family had hundreds and hundreds of connections and leaves and people that were already on that account. So I immediately jumped onto that and I linked my DNA to my Bennett family tree. And guess what? For those of you that have an Ancestry DNA account, leaves did not pop up. What does that mean? Something's wrong with this kit. Something was wrong with my sample because things are not matching. I, I immediately fired off an email to Ancestry.com. This kit is bogus. You must have mixed up samples. I don't know what's going on, but this is not my family. Everything that you could possibly think of to justify why I did not match 
is what I was, I was going through my head. Never, never did I not match because I was not blood. Did not believe that for one second because mom and dad had always told me. I had asked. I had already asked. I'm not adopted. I am their child. I am their child. So life is going on. I have an ancestry kit that's sitting there. I have children that are adopted. I have children that are birthed and they're getting more mature and kids are starting to graduate from high school. Grandchildren are now coming. My youngest daughter was now pregnant and really struggling with that pregnancy. And my mother was very much involved. She would always call and she would ask, how's she doing? What's going on today? But one thing about my mom that was always strange to me was that she was really oblivious to a lot of mom things. Like my mother always forgot my birthday, consistently never remembered my birthday. That always bothered me. How does a mom, how does a mother forget her daughter's birthday? But I just chalked it up to, she's got so much on her mind. Life is go. you know, she's a little bit older. Maybe she doesn't remember. My mother did not come to the birth of my children. Just wasn't important to her. So when my daughter was pregnant and my mom was asking questions, and I happened to mention that she was having the butterflies and we are all so excited that we were experiencing this with her. And my mother one day says, butterflies? I don't understand what you're talking about, this butterflies. What is, I've never felt that. And my husband, I had a habit of talking to my mom on speakerphone um, many times just because I needed verification of some of the nutty things that she would say to me. But this day I was bothering my husband. He was trying to watch a race and he heard my mother say that, that she had no concept of the fetal motion and the fetal movement within the womb. And my husband kind of snapped and he said, hang up the phone. I'm tired of you talking to her. Do you not understand that this woman has never given birth in her life and she is not your mother? When are you going to get back on? I think he said something like, get off the pot and get back on that kit and find out who your real people are. What are you, what are you saying to me? She's not your mother. I went into... For those of you that are a little bit older, I went into Laura Petrie mode and I was like, what are you saying? You can't be telling me this. How could you say this? How could you, why did you never say this before? And he's looking at me like, do you honestly believe she's your mother? And I was like, but she said she was and she told me she was. And he looked at me straight in the face and said, I've never believed she was your mother that rocked the very core of not only me, of my trust in him, in almost in our marriage, because how do you say this to me 25 years in? How do you say this to me when I have been with you since I was 18 years old and you've seen my interactions with this woman and you've seen me be frustrated and not understand why our connection is not mother and daughter like. And today you decide to tell me that you don't think she's my mom. I had no words and it bothered me so much that the next day I got up, I got in my car and I need to take just a few exits on the highway to get from my house to, to my job. Only three exits. I got on the highway, I got on I-94 and I headed towards Detroit. I passed the exit where I worked and I kept on going and I started crying and I did not even know where I was going because it dawned on me. I've never seen my birth certificate. Mom always told me that she lost it early. Mom always told me, oh, they have one at the school. That's all that matters. I'd never seen baby pictures of me as an infant because my parents said 
that they were destroyed in a flood that we had in the basement. And so all of my pictures started around too. So I didn't even know where I was going. I didn't know where I was driving to. All I knew was that I needed an answer that day. I had to find out that day. So while I was driving, I started making phone calls. I knew that I was born in Detroit, but for those of you that are from a large metro metropolitan city, when someone says that they're born in Detroit, they could actually be from Southfield, from Romulus, from Ecorse, from Inkster, and all of that's kind of grouped in, and it's just all called Detroit. You could be from Wayne County, Macomb County, Oakland County. I had no idea, because I never questioned what they said to me. So I started calling, and I think I started with Macomb County, and I didn't get an answer. I then called Oakland County and I got a voicemail and I left a voicemail and I called Wayne County. Wayne County, someone answered the phone and I started telling her, I don't really know what I'm looking for. I don't really know what to ask you, but I think I need somebody in post-adoption services. And she explained to me that, no, there's no walk-ins. You just can't walk in. There's forms and everything that you have to petition and you have to go online and you have to fill them out. And I'm explaining to her, I'm in my car. I'm coming to Detroit. I just need to know where to start. I just need to know what county I was even born in to know which direction I need to drive in. And she was puzzled because she did not understand. I honestly had no idea where I was born, where I came from, how I started. And she went back over the procedure for what you have to do to get this information. And I'm finally, I'm like, lady, I don't even know if there's a reason for me to call you. I don't even know if I am adopted. All I do know is I need to go in the direction that will give me my birth certificate. So subsequently I did find out Wayne County post adoption was the correct place. And I drove and I continued driving that day to Wayne County post adoption. Work didn't know why I didn't show up. My husband didn't know that I didn't go to work. No one knew that I had gotten in my car and kept on driving. I needed to put my big girl panties on and go do this. And I needed to do it by myself. I, I couldn't have anybody talk me out of it. I couldn't hear anyone else's opinions. I needed this connection to my foundation. I needed to know where to start. Because in that moment, I knew I did not know who I was. And if I didn't know who I was, then that meant I didn't know who I was as a wife. I didn't know who I was as a mother. I didn't know if I was good for any of these people. If I had issues that really were my issues all these years, or was I imagining things? And when I showed up, at Wayne County Adoption Post Services and told her why I am here. And she gave me the spiel again. And I literally started crying and explained to her, I know nothing. This is what I was told, that my mother is my mother and my father is my father. And they met when my father was 46 and my mother was 40. And it was late in life. And that they had prayed to the holy heavens that they would be gifted with this child. And not only were they gifted with me, they were gifted with my brother and that we had a wonderful, amazing life. And I was very spoiled and very pampered, but there was a connection that did not make sense. And finally, this lady looks at me and she goes back into her office and she comes back out with 
what look like an old fashioned library card that you fill out uh, where all the books have been checked out and it opened up and it folded and it was yellowing from age. And she's holding the card in her hand and she's kind of waving it like this. And she immediately says, well, Sharon, the good thing is the adoption agency that you were placed with has closed down. So you will be able to file for everything that you need from Lansing. And I immediately go, wait, 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 wait. You have the wrong person. My name is Alicia. Sharon is my middle name. Have you looked up the wrong person? And she kind of ignored me and kept on talking. No, well, you were placed through this agency and it's been closed for years. So you should be able to get all of your records. And I'm shaking. I am literally shaking. My hands are literally shaking. My teeth are chattering. And I'm listening to her and I'm saying, is that me? Is that my card? Are you telling me that you have me in this? You have me. On this card, I was reduced down to information on a index card that was yellowing and you have all the information and you can't tell me who I am, where I came from. I have to file for this. And I literally broke down. And I literally was taken the papers and the documents that she gave me. I went out to my car. I started filling them out. I'm literally trying to find a way. How can I pay her now? How can I do all of this now? How can I get this information before I leave? And it's all hitting me and it's all flooding. I'm adopted. My mother is not my mother. My father is not my father. Everything that I felt, everything that I believed, every dream that I ever had was all rushing in at the same time. And I literally was sitting in my car outside of this court building, banging on my steering wheel. They lied to me, they lied to me. And I'm, at this time, I was 53 years old. For 51 years, I had these memories of leaving a mother, of being separated from a mother, of being taken from a mother. And in those dreams, the face that I never saw, that I saw was never the mom that I had. The feelings that I felt was never connected to the mom I had. And it was all rushing so fast and it was all making sense that I had my whole life crumbling in front of me, that nothing was real, that I did not even know my name, that I did not know my beginning, that I didn't know my foundation, that, and the littlest things, my husband doesn't know who he's married. My children don't know who their mother is. My adopted kids have more of a concept of adoption than I do because I had poured so much into learning to be the great adopted mom that now it's all been slapped in my face, that it's all come back to haunt me. And the journey began to unravel all of those connections and all of that trauma and all of that drama and all of the missed opportunities and the rich family history that I had been so proud of that I thought that that ancestry DNA kit was giving me, I'm realizing, do these people know? Does everybody know? And I start calling and they all knew. All of my first cousins knew. All of my aunts and uncles knew. And I was just devastated that what I considered the lie of all lies could last for 53 years and people, not one person ever said, 
Not one person ever slipped up. Not one person ever was caught whispering and I caught wind of it that she's adopted. And when I say I crumbled, I fetal position in the bed, cried and crumbled for three weeks to the point that my husband was trying to find places to send me because there was no helping. There was no helping. There was no reasoning. There was no concept. There was no idea of how this could have possibly been, how this could have happened. Why would it happen? Why would they do it to me? Why would they not share it with me? How do you allow me to give birth and you claim these grandchildren as your own? How do you allow me to adopt and not share your adoption journey with me? How do you allow me to stand at the grave sites of grandparents and cry with you when they're not my grandparents and mine are in the same cemetery? When I say that resiliency was my middle name, <laughs> it was where I had to go every single day to get up, to function, to even get out of the bed. My very heart was broken, not broken because I was adopted, broken because of the missed opportunities to have embraced the life that I should have had, the connections that I should have had, the connections with the mother that I thought didn't understand me now made sense. And they could have made sense at 13. They could have made sense at 17. They could have made sense when I'm crying because it's not important enough for you to come to my children's birth. They would have made sense. The dreams made sense. The overbearing, overindulged performances made sense. And I had to put all these pieces back together and create a new me, one that had developed a way to understand this and one that had to develop a new way to learn how to parent not only my birth children, but my adopted children, to learn a new way how to be a different type of wife, to be a different person, to find my people and when I say I dug deep, I dug deep. I turned every rock and I turned them hard and I turned them fast and I found them because the connections were always there. Not only did I was I never removed from my birth family, my birth family and my adopted family lived in the same community. Some of them lived on the same street. My adopted mother knew my birth mother and kept all of this a secret. They met. I finally got a picture of my biological grandmother and I had met her. I was connected and not told of the connections. I was introduced and not told who I was introduced to. I had meetings and occurrences and visits with family members and not ever told that they were family members. And all of those were now losses that I now felt because they were missed opportunities. And as I talk to people and I stand before them, I plead with adopted parents to be honest with their children. I implore and encourage adopted children to ask the questions that they feel within their heart, that they don't understand, that they know things aren't matching up. Because in your heart, if they're not matching up, 
there's a story there that you're missing. And one of the things that I'm the biggest advocate of that I truly believe is the most important is that in some point in every adopted person's life, that is going to be up to you to determine. And it'll be up to you to determine the appropriate age to do it. But at some point in every adopted person's life, they have to have their beginning. They have to have their chapter one. They have to know the story on how they came to be. Because without that, there's no foundation. And without that, everything that you have built from that moment on that is built on a false creation can easily crumble with one revelation, with one slip up, with one DNA kit, with one relative who knew the secret. And that is a devastating moment that you can't undo, but you definitely can do it differently with open, honest dialogue and communication. And as I said, it's different from everybody for everybody. I'm glad I didn't know at 13. I'm glad I didn't know at 17 or 18. But by the time I was married, by the time I had children, by the time I was making decisions for my family and health decisions and filling out health forms that say, does your father have diabetes? Does your mother have high blood pressure? And I'm filling those out falsely. That's the time that I think I needed to know that history and be the most important. So I share with each of you my story. That's the synopsis of it. I deal with it every day. I have found siblings. Both of my parents, my biological parents had passed on. I miss them just by years. I missed my mother by three years. I missed my father by five years. And coincidentally, my parents, my adoption was actually the decision of my grandmother because my mother was only 14 years old. But my parents stayed friends their entire lives until death do they part. And not only were my siblings looking for me their entire lives, the majority of them knew the story and I was welcomed with open arms and graciousness. And I now have extended families in every direction. And I've now been to my own family reunions along with my adopted family's family reunions. And I am in such a better place for knowing. And I would never go back. And I would never undo the way that it happened because that was God's choice for me to find out. And I am thankful that I did. But if I had had a little bit of involvement in it. And now that I know how to be a better parent to not only my birth children and my adopted children, I actually made my daughter name her daughter after her birth mother so that she would have that peace that would carry on. And we would never forget the woman who gave birth to her, who gave me the privilege of raising her. And so now, I introduce myself again as Sharon Denise Atkinson. In the beginning, we put the name Alicia, but I definitely embrace Sharon Denise because she is the very core of me and the foundation of me. And I was born in Detroit, Michigan at Henry Ford Hospital on February 4th to Alma Jean Atkinson and Herman Felton. And that's my story. Oh, thank you so much, Alicia. That was beautiful. I, your story is so, so moving and also heartbreaking and you tell, you tell it so, so beautifully, right? Everybody. Yeah. And you're yes. also my birthday buddy. Cause I was born on February 4th when you just said that. No way. <laughs> yes. So we're birthday buddies. Birthday. Oh yeah. Friends. It's just, it's so beautiful. So beautiful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So what we're going to do at this time right now, we're going to stop the recording so we can open it up to questions from our attendees. Okay.